yeah good afternoon all of you now am i audible and visible to you okay so we are going to if you uh, you can listen am i if i'm visible and i'm audible clearly please show me a thumbs up in the chat box so that we can begin with the session okay great so uh, this is a very important session where i'm going to revise maximum images in obs and real uh, in obs with you today tomorrow i'm going to take up your gyne session now uh, this is one of the repeat questions which was asked this is a pyq and it they had shown you an image of a very healthy baby right and neet is very fond of asking you images of healthy baby so this if they show you any image of a healthy baby and they ask you that in which condition do you see such a baby so please remember that uh, most important condition where you get macrosomia is diabetes please remember that the most common fetal complication of diabetes is also macrosomia macrosomia in indian context it means that the weight of the baby is more than equal to 4 kg right and macrosomia is a complication which is seen both in gestational diabetes and in case of pre gestational diabetes remember i have sent you this pdf ha the, the other pdf i didn't sent you deliberately i thought maybe you know when you write you will learn more but i have seen so many requests of the other pd sessions pdf also that i will upload it on my telegram today only now the other risk factors for macrosomia quickly remember that it is post term pregnancy diabetes i've told you multiparity male sex and obesity or excessive weight gain during pregnancy right now acog i told you in the pyq session also that acog recommends that whenever there is macrosomia uh, then in that case what are the recommendations for macrosomia acog recommends that if it is a non diabetic female then in a non diabetic female induction a uh, cesarean section cesarean section should be done when the weight of the fetus is more than equal to 5 kg and in a diabetic female cesarean section should be done if weight is more than equal to 4.5 kg otherwise we go for uh, vaginal delivery now as far as post term pregnancy is concerned remember that acog recommends that whenever pregnancy goes beyond 41 weeks although post term is 42 weeks but acog says that whenever uh you know pregnancy goes beyond 41 weeks you have to go for induction of labor if they ask you what is the best mode of delivery in macrosomia the best mode of delivery in macrosomia is vaginal delivery unless and until the in a non diabetic female if weight is more than equal to 5 kg and in diabetic female if weight of the baby is more than equal to 4.5 kg right now the second image over here you know this is one of the ultrasound images and here you can see proper funneling of the os and one question which they can ask you is from where are you going to measure the cervical length remember that acog says that in all females who have previous history of preterm labor number 1 plus they should have a singleton pregnancy this time so in all such cases you have to do measurement of cervical length starting from 14 to 16 weeks of pregnancy right so in this case they may ask you that how are you going to measure the cervical length remember tvs is the best method for measuring cervical length and always for measuring cervical length you have to measure the cervical length from the tip of the funnel can you see over here from the tip of the funnel going up till the external os so if you are a maro subscriber in one of the gts you were given a question where various marks were made so one of the mark was you know over here that are you going to measure the cervical length from here to here no this is incorrect are you going to measure the cervical length from 
here to here no this is also incorrect cervical length has to be measured going from the tip of the funnel and up till the external os this is the correct method for measuring the cervical length right so measurement has to be from the tip of the funnel and up till the external os trans abdominal scan is not reliable for measurement of cervical length and this what you are getting funnel shaped appearance this funnel shaped appearance this is this is what is called as funneling funneling is protrusion of the amniotic membranes into the cervical canal so this is one more sign of incompetent os or preterm labor right but then the best thing to do whenever you want to diagnose incompetent os or whenever you want to diagnose preterm labor is to measure the cervical length now what is the cut off of cervical length for predicting preterm labor for predicting preterm labor it is 2.5 cm and for diagnosing preterm labor so this is how you predict preterm labor to diagnose preterm labor the cut off length is 2 cm right clear to all of you so this question you can get this is one of the images which you might get in case of preterm labor right then then over here what are you seeing over here in this case what you are seeing is you are seeing this over here this black colored area means where there is fluid right so these are all amniotic fluid pockets will you which you can see and what are we measuring we are measuring the vertical the largest vertical length of amniotic fluid pocket and in each quadrant so what we are doing we are measuring the largest vertical length in each quadrant and then we are adding it this is what is called as amniotic fluid index right now this please remember amniotic fluid index is not the most sensitive method for measuring amniotic fluid because it cannot be used in twin pregnancy what is the best method for measuring amniotic fluid which is the best parameter the best parameter is single deepest pocket so out of all these whichever is the largest vertical pocket i am going to measure that and that is the best parameter for this is the best parameter for amniotic fluid right now amniotic fluid index normally it is between 5 to 25 cm or you can say 5 to 24 cm if it becomes less than 5 cm that is oligohydramnios if it is more than equal to 25 cm that is polyhydramnios one number one number two single largest vertical pocket or single deepest pocket the normal values are between 2 to 8 cm if it is less than 2 it is oligo if it is more than equal to 8 it is poly now another thing which i want you to remember is that when you are Uh, uh you know taking out or measuring the biophysical score in biophysical score it is amniotic fluid index which is measured whereas in modified biophysical score in modified biophysical score sorry so let just let me write it over here in modified biophysical score it is the single largest vertical pocket which you are going to measure in case of biophysical score it is amniotic fluid index which you measure now what i have written over here is that both oligohydramnios and polyhydramnios if it is moderate or if it is severe it belongs to high risk pregnancy so oligohydramnios and polyhydramnios both come under high risk pregnancies right if it is moderate to severe mild oligo and mild poly are not high risk pregnancies right now then they can show you this image this image is an integration of surgery radiology and obgy so i'm sure all of you know from your surgery knowledge what are you seeing over here what are you seeing over here 
Tell me what are you seeing over here? This is quickly. I will be very happy if you keep on responding in the chat box. So write down in the chat box what ultrasound image are you seeing over here? Yes, you are seeing a double bubble sign and this double bubble sign is seen in duodenal atresia. Now, how can this be linked to OBGY? So there are two ways in which duodenal atresia image can be linked to OBGY. Now, duodenal atresia is going to lead to polyhydramnios because of defective swelling. So, in the mother, because of this, you are going to get polyhydramnios. Next, number two way in which they can link this to OBGY. They can show you this image and they can ask you what is the problem, you know, uh, the most common problem which might be associated, this kind of a problem might be associated with which karyotype. So, remember, duodenal atresia is associated with Down's syndrome right? So, double bubble sign can be asked in OBGY in the form of two questions. Number one, duodenal atresia leads to polyhydramnios. Number two, duodenal atresia is seen in, uh, it is associated with Down's syndrome. Clear to all of you? Yes, I want you to remember this image also. This image over here is again an integrated surgery, radiology and OBGY question. So tell me what image is are you seeing here? What sign are you seeing over here? What sign are you seeing over here? Quickly respond in the chat box. Yes, this is what is a keyhole sign. And in which condition do you get a keyhole sign? You get a keyhole sign in case of posterior urethral valve. Very good. In case of posterior urethral valve. Now, if there is a posterior urethral valve, what problem are you going to get? You are going to get oligohydramnios in the mother, right? So, that is one way in which the question can be linked to OBGY. Now, please remember that renal defects in the fetus, they lead to oligohydramnios and swallowing defects like duodenal atresia, like tracheoesophageal uh, atresia, uh, they all lead to polyhydramnios. Number two, although all most of the renal defects in the fetus, they lead to oligohydramnios, Barter's syndrome leads to polyhydramnios. If fetus is having Barter's syndrome, that leads to polyhydramnios, right? There is salt water wasting in Barter's syndrome, so it leads to polyhydramnios. Clear? Then, then you can get an image like this. So, the following defect in the newborn is seen if mother during pregnancy has option A, diabetes, option B, oligohydramnios, option C, ingested lithium, if the mother has ingested lithium, option D, if the mother has ingested thalidomide. So, what are you seeing over here in this image? In this image, you are seeing that the limbs of the baby are amputated. So, there is digital amputation, right? So, there is digital amputation which you can see over here. And if there is digital amputation, this is what is called as amniotic band syndrome. Amniotic band syndrome. The other name for amniotic band syndrome is Streeter's syndrome or it is also called as constriction band syndrome. Right? Now, this is seen whenever the membranes rupture and there is oligohydramnios, the membranes tightly wrap around the baby's digits in the form like a rubber band and then the vascular supply to the distal part of the digits is hampered and that leads to digital, uh, you know, that leads to digital limb amputation, 
right and this is what is amniotic band syndrome or streeter syndrome so this is seen in oligohydramnios or in the option you can have premature rupture of membrane so this is seen when the membranes rupture prematurely now if it is diabetes in case of diabetes also you get a problem in the limbs but the problem is sacral agenesis so this was your neat 2020 question so in case of diabetes if it is pre gestational diabetes you get sacral agenesis and this very image was asked in your neat 2020 and it was given what condition in the mother is associated with the following fetal anomaly so this is associated with pre gestational diabetes remember congenital malformations are not seen in gestational diabetes they are only seen in pre gestational diabetes right now if they ask you what is the most common fetal complication of diabetes simple question most common fetal complication of diabetes you are not going to say congenital malformations because congenital malformations is seen in pre gestational diabetes and not gestational diabetes the most common fetal complication of diabetes is macrosomia right now congenital malformations mein agar pucha jaye that in just pre gestational diabetes in congenital malformations what is the most common system which is involved most common system which is involved is cardiovascular system most common anomaly which you get is vsd most specific anomaly which you get is caudal regression syndrome which is also called as sacral agenesis and this image is showing you caudal regression syndrome or sacral agenesis if they ask you most specific cardiovascular anomaly then that is tga transposition of the great arteries and if they ask you most common cardiovascular finding in a baby of uh, overt diabetes then the most common cardiovascular finding is hocm the difference between anomaly and finding is anomaly is not reversible whereas finding is reversible after birth so most common cardiovascular anomaly is vst but the most common cardiovascular finding is hocm clear to all of you right then another thing over here another option over here was if the mother has ingested lithium now tell me if the mother ingests lithium what do you get in the fetus so if mother ingests lithium what malformation are you going to get or what anomaly are you going to get in the baby tell tell quickly i am waiting for you to answer in the chat box excellent dia sara excellent it is epstein anomaly now whenever they want to you to identify that lithium ingestion has taken place what image are they going to give you they are going to give you image of a fetal echocardiography right and you are going to get tricuspid regurgitation that is you are going to get epstein anomaly right okay now what if mother has ingested thalidomide now if mother has ingested thalidomide what do you get you get proximal limb defect that is phocomelia so there is a lot of difference between amniotic band syndrome and there is a lot of difference between phocomelia in amniotic band syndrome there is distal limb amputation whereas in phocomelia their problem is going to be in the proximal limb there will be proximal limb amputation right so phocomelia happens due to thalidomide ingestion and there you are going to get proximal limb defects clear now one more drug can lead to problem in the limbs and that is warfarin 
so whenever mother has taken warfarin it can lead to defective cartilage formation and that leads to stippled epiphyses so if they are showing you an x ray it is sobhan raj sahu you don't have to quit neat pg 2023 If there is still time just give it your best shot there is no need to for any one of you to quit you haven't come this far to just to quit right okay this video will be available uh, later on also don't worry now stippled epiphyses so whenever they show you a image of a baby where they are showing you the x ray image of the baby and you are seeing stippled epiphyses then that means mother has taken warfarin during pregnancy number 1 iske sath sath another thing which happens when mother takes warfarin during pregnancy is you get depressed nasal bridge you get a depressed nasal bridge which is called as saddle deformity depressed nasal bridge or saddle deformity right clear to all of you okay so uh whenever a mother takes warfarin during pregnancy you get stippled epiphyses depressed nasal bridge coanal atresia and in 50% cases cns abnormalities maximum abnormalities happen when warfarin is taken between 6 to 12 weeks that a, that is a broader range a, a narrower range is when warfarin is taken between 6 to 9 weeks and the dose of warfarin if it is more than 5 mg per day then that is also highly teratogenic clear to all of you right and warfarin embryopathy what is this called as this is called as chondrodysplasia so if you see that in your image they have given you the entire x ray of the baby with stippled epiphyses depressed nasal bridge right or saddle shaped nose then that means it is because of warfarin injection right now the other thing which i want to tell you about drugs is you know anti epileptic drugs now anti epileptic drugs what is the most common congenital malformation which anti epileptic drugs lead to so the single best answer is neural tube defect and the second best answer will be cardiac malformation so anti epileptics they lead to neural tube defect in the baby and it leads to cardiac malformation that's the second best answer maximum teratogenicity with anti epileptics the drug which has maximum teratogenicity is valproic acid followed by phenytoin and phenobarbiton the least teratogenic anti epileptic drugs are lamotrigine and levetiracetam now comes the most important confusing area that if a female is on anti epileptics how much folic acid supplementation you should be giving to her and various people have various answers to this i am not saying anyone is right or anyone is wrong because various societies have different answers to this if you follow the acog guidelines acog guidelines specifically say that the dose of folic acid which has to be given if a female is on anti epileptic drugs is 400 micrograms per day right so till now because williams 25th edition did not have any say on how much is the dose of uh, folic acid when anti epileptic drugs are being given we used to follow the acog guidelines now i am making you read what williams 26th edition page 1129 has to say read it for yourself pre conceptional counseling this is in the chapter of epilepsy oral folic acid supplementation with 0.4 mg per day is begun one month before conception 
the dose is increased to 4 mg when the woman taking anti epileptic medication becomes pregnant irrespective of the medication aisa nahi hai ki if she is taking valproic acid then only you have to give her 4 mg or if she is taking phenytoin then only you have to give her 4 mg so before she conceives you give her 400 microgram the moment she conceives and she is on anti epileptic drugs you are going to change the dosage from 400 microgram now you are going to make it 4 mg clear have you read it meet a uh, where is dr meet some something came by dr meet right clear to all of you so this is exact this these are exact lines of williams and that is why i have put it over here so that there is no confusion lamotrigine and levetiracetam are the most safest anti epileptics during pregnancy someone was asking me what is the dose if for sickle cell anemia for sickle cell anemia in sickle cell anemia the dose of folic acid is 5 mg per day for treating megaloblastic anemia or folic acid deficiency anemia the dose is 1 mg per day right then the routine daily allowance of folic acid is 500 micrograms per day clear to all of you yes so over here my entire focus your entire focus should be on these lines that before anti epileptics you know any female who is on anti epileptic drugs before she conceives the dose is 400 micrograms the moment she conceives the dose becomes 4 mg irrespective of the anti epileptic medication right okay now next very important thing is an image of fetal alcohol syndrome they may ask you about fetal alcohol syndrome in fetal alcohol syndrome you get a triad of microcephaly growth restriction and typical facial features so there will be a triad of microcephaly growth restriction and typical facial features yes obviously if there is previous history of neural tube defect then the dose is 4 mg per day and if there is no previous history of neural tube defect then the dose is 400 micrograms per day right so i hope uh, yes goa's famous beer bar excellent medico uh, forever excellent that is the mnemonic which i have told all of you in the maro app over here i want to just make it very simple that in case of fetal alcohol syndrome you are going to get microcephaly growth restriction and typical facial features in typical facial features there is going to be indistinct philtrum small palpebral fissures so the eyes are going to be very small there will be indistinct philtrum and there is going to be thin upper lip or thin vermilion border right so these are features of fetal alcohol syndrome clear warfarin embryopathy i have told you so these are images which you need to know from drug ingestion and various you know uh, teratogens for example in diabetes the teratogen is hyperglycemia hyperglycemia leads to free radical formation and that leads to congenital malformation so these are images related to various teratogens now images related to ctg now this image over here what is it showing this is showing that an nst or ctg is in progress right now uh, please remember that nst graph and ctg graph there is just one difference nst is the same thing when you are try you are uh, you know recording the fetal heart rate in pregnancy the procedure is called as nst and when you do it during labor that is called as ctg the difference between nst and ctg graph is in nst you get a single graph and that single graph is going to represent the fetal heart rate whereas in a ctg strip you get two graphs 
the graph which you get at the top is representing fetal heart rate and the graph which you get at the bottom represents uterine contractions it represents uterine contractions right so look over here tell me in this graph first tell me here this particular strip is showing you only one graph now because it is showing you only one graph that means it is an nst graph right and this over here is fetal heart rate tracing and these arrows are the ones which represent fetal movements right now what is this nst strip showing you this nst strip is showing you that with the fetal movement fetal heart rate is increasing can you see that with the fetal movement fetal heart rate is increasing yes so in a period of 20 minutes in a period of 20 minutes if you are getting two or more than two accelerations that means it the nst is reactive so in this strip i can see that there are two or more than two accelerations so i am going to say that this is a reactive nst right how do you define acceleration acceleration means increase in fetal heart rate by 15 beats per minute for 15 seconds so whenever a female comes to us with decreased fetal movement the first test which you do the screening test which you do is nst you make a female lie down comfortably preferably in the left lateral position and you you know attach the nst machine and over here there is going to be a bell you are going to tell this female that there is a bell or a button which she has to press whenever she experiences fetal movements and these fetal movements will then be recorded in the form of arrows in the nst strip right ab jab hum nst strip ko read karenge i will have to be sure that when fetal movement is happening fetal acceleration is also happening if i am getting two or more than two accelerations in a period of 20 minutes that means nst is reactive clear to all of you if in a period of 20 minutes you are not getting two accelerations then in that case you are going to repeat nst for 20 more minutes so to call it as a non reactive nst total you have to do nst for 40 minutes clear to all of you yes now come over here again this is an nst strip in this nst strip again i am seeing fetal heart rate but what is the shape of the fetal heart rate isn't it looking like a wave right can you see a wave like pattern this wave like pattern is called as sinusoidal heart rate pattern and this sinusoidal heart rate pattern is seen whenever there is fetal anemia whenever there is fetal anemia you are going to get sinusoidal heart rate pattern and this you get in case of rh incompatibility in case of twin to twin transfusion syndrome and in case of vasa previa now same thing you can get on ctg strip also so whenever you are getting a sinusoidal heart rate pattern that means it is an indication for immediate termination of pregnancy sinusoidal heart rate pattern is an indication for immediate termination of pregnancy right so this image is sinusoidal heart rate pattern then now first tell me is this an nst strip or a ctg strip is this an nst strip or a ctg strip what are you seeing over here this is doppler are you now baba this over here what are you seeing you are seeing 
two graphs over here so this upper graph is fetal heart rate the bottom one is representing uterine contraction so this is a ctg strip now what we are seeing is that when the uterus is contracting fetal heart rate is decreasing right when the uterus is contracting fetal heart rate is decreasing this means i am looking at some kind of deceleration increase in heart rate was acceleration decrease in heart rate is deceleration now you will have to look at whether this deceleration is gradual or not sabse pehle dekhna hai ki deceleration gradual hai ki sudden hai so over here what i am seeing is that the deceleration is gradual right so see over here this is also a deceleration right is this deceleration gradual or is it uh sudden this is again a gradual deceleration this over here check this out this over here is also deceleration now this deceleration is it gradual or is it sudden this deceleration is sudden right so first of all whenever you get a deceleration check whether it is gradual or whether it is sudden gradual deceleration ka matlab hai either it is early deceleration or it is late deceleration sudden deceleration ka matlab hai variable deceleration sudden deceleration is seen only in variable deceleration gradual can be early or it can be late the next thing which you have to see is whether the deceleration is corresponding with the uterine contraction or not what do i mean by corresponding that when the contraction begins the deceleration begins and when the contraction ends the deceleration ends right like it is happening over here when the contraction begins the deceleration begins when the contraction ends the deceleration ends so if the deceleration is exactly corresponding to the uterine contractions then it means you are looking at early deceleration early deceleration is seen in case of head compression and head compression may occur during labor and that is why it is physiological right so it is physiological right now look at this deceleration over here yahan pe again it is gradual so either it has to be early or it has to be late now the contraction begins here lekin deceleration abhi start nahi hua jo dip hai fetal heart rate mein that hasn't started yet when the uterine uterine contraction is at the peak at that time the deceleration is beginning and when the contraction ends the deceleration doesn't end the dip in fetal heart rate continues even beyond the uterine contraction iska matlab this is late iska beginning bhi late hai iska end bhi late hai it is beginning after the uterine contraction and it is ending after the uterine contraction and this is what is called as late deceleration please remember late deceleration is seen in utero placental insufficiency and this is the worst kind of deceleration to happen right now then comes your third ctg finding over here now in this ctg graph what i am seeing that dip ho raha hai but it's a very sudden dip right and whenever you get sudden dip that is what is variable deceleration and variable deceleration has a very variable relationship to the contraction sometimes it is going to happen at the beginning of the contraction sometimes it is going to have happen at the middle of the contraction sometimes towards the end of the contraction so the relationship of the dip in fetal heart rate and the uterine contraction is variable please remember vice chancellor vc so variable deceleration is seen in case of cord compression now this is something which all of you remember but cord compression milta hai jab bhi oligohydramnios hota hai tab hame cord compression milta hai right so this means that variable deceleration can be seen in case of oligohydramnios oligohydramnios kab milta hai jab membranes rupture hoti hai 
so in case of prom also you can get variable deceleration clear to all of you yes now i want all of you to notice over here something this is the dip in fetal heart rate jab ye deceleration is recovering right at that time you are seeing a slight increase in fetal heart rate this increase in fetal heart rate may happen at the beginning of the deceleration or at the towards the end of the deceleration and these are called as the shoulders of variable deceleration so the slight increase in fetal heart rate which happens either at the beginning or at the end of the deceleration variable deceleration is called as shoulders of variable deceleration right so these are shoulders of variable deceleration ha when there is cord compression that is one indication for doing amino infusion now jitni bhi ctg findings hoti hain we classify them into category 1 category 2 and category 3 category 1 ctg finding means absolutely normal ctg absolutely normal ctg ka matlab hai fetal heart rate will be between 110 to 160 beats per minute there will be a beat to beat variability of 5 to 25 beats per minute so this is how fetal heart rate is it is never regular right this is the kind of graph which you get if you start getting a graph like this this means it is fixed fetal heart rate and fixed fetal heart rate is never good right fixed fetal heart rate is never good so beat to beat variability should be present and it should be 5 to 25 beats per minute in case of ctg there should be no late decelerations no variable decelerations early decelerations may be present or they may be absent acceleration may be present or may be absent see remember nst may kya important hai nst may acceleration important hai ctg may acceleration hai ya nahi hai doesn't matter deceleration nahi hona chahiye and which deceleration shouldn't be there late deceleration shouldn't be there and variable deceleration shouldn't be there right this is how you say that the ctg is normal now comes category 3 ctg there are certain ctg findings which come under category 3 ctg findings these category 3 ctg findings include sinusoidal heart rate pattern so if you are getting sinusoidal heart rate pattern then that comes under category 3 ctg finding or if you are getting absent variability of fetal heart rate fetal heart rate is absent along with any one of the following that one could be bradycardia that could be persistent late deceleration or persistent variable decelerations that comes under category 3 ctg finding so instead of writing that there is fetal distress in a question they can give you that the ctg showed category 3 findings or they can say that there was absent variability with persistent late deceleration what is the next step so whenever you are getting category 3 ctg findings the important thing is that now i have to go for immediate delivery i have to do a cesarean section right because there is fetal distress but the uh, the other important thing is that while i am preparing the patient for cesarean section i have to give in utero resuscitation in utero resuscitation ka kya matlab hota hai in utero resuscitation means you will प्लेस द पेशेंट इन लेफ्ट लेटरल पोजिशन अगर आप पेशेंट को ऑक्सीटोसिन दे रहे थे इफ यू आर गिविंग ऑक्सीटोसिन यू विल स्टॉप ऑक्सीटोसिन यू विल गिव हर ऑक्सीजन राइट यू विल गिव हर आईवी फ्लूड्स एंड यू आर नाउ गोइंग टू टेक हर अप फॉर सिजेरियन section so see category 3 ctg finding means immediate termination of pregnancy and intra uterine resuscitation intra uterine resuscitation may left lateral position stop oxytocin give her oxygen by mask clear to all of you right now now suppose you get a question like this 
The CTG graph done in a female G2P1 undergoing induction of labor is shown in the image. All of the following are true statements with respect to the condition shown. Option A, it can be seen with mesoprost. Option B, graph shows prolonged deceleration. Option C, graph shows uterine hyperstimulation. Option D, graph shows variable deceleration. Yes, uh, Pratyush, absent variability means that a graph will be like this. Right? Now tell me, what are you seeing over here? Now in this, what are you seeing? In this condition you are seeing, so let's see, talk about fetal heart rate over here. Sabse pehle fetal heart rate wala graph dekho. In fetal heart rate graph, sabse pehle tell me whether it is CTG or whether it is NST. This is CTG. Now tell me what is the baseline fetal heart rate. Baseline fetal heart rate is somewhere over here which is around 130. 130 beats per minute. Variability. Is variability present? Yes, variability is present, but variability is decreased. I can see, yes, variability is present, but there is slightly decreased variability. So, yes, variability present, but it is decreased. Right? Then, can you see whether there is acceleration or whether there is deceleration? Yes, uh, Yukta, sinusoidal pattern is also, it also comes under absent variability. That is why it is a category 3 CTG finding, right? Now, what are you seeing over here? You are seeing over here that there is a deceleration, right? So, I can see a deceleration over here. So, yes, deceleration is seen. Now, as I told you, Acceleration ka kya matlab hota hai? Acceleration means increase in fetal heart rate by 15 beats per minute for 15 seconds. Similarly, deceleration means dip in fetal heart rate by 15 beats per minute for 15 seconds. Maximum deceleration can last for 2 minutes. Maximum deceleration may last for 2 minutes. If a deceleration lasts for 2 to 10 minutes, that is called as prolonged deceleration. So, if a deceleration lasts for 2 to 10 minutes, that's a prolonged deceleration. And if deceleration lasts for more than 10 minutes, so, agar hume lagta hai ki deceleration is lasting for more than 10 minutes, then that's not a deceleration. Then it's not a deceleration it is a change in baseline fetal heart rate. So, normally decelerations last maximum up till 2 minutes. If they are lasting for 2 to 10 minutes, that's a prolonged deceleration. And if a deceleration lasts for more than equal to 10 minutes, that's a change in baseline fetal heart rate. Now, in this case, what I am seeing, first of all, remember, each big square, each big square on a CTG strip is one minute, right? So, this deceleration over here is lasting for one minute, two minutes, three minutes and somewhere around three and a half minutes, right? So, this means, yes, this is prolonged deceleration, right? Now, this is one thing which I have understood that it is the graph is showing prolonged deceleration. The other thing is that you have to look at uterine contractions. Now, if uterine contractions, if they are happening, three contractions in 10 minutes, then that indicates adequate uterine contractions, right? If the contractions are more than equal to 5 in 10 minutes, 
then that is what is uterine hyperstimulation or it is also called as tachycystole in this case what i am seeing till here uterine contractions were normal ab yahan pe what i am seeing is hyperstimulation a number of uterine contractions happening one after the other right so yes the graph shows uterine hyperstimulation please remember whenever you are doing induction of labor with either mesoprost or oxytocin then uterine hyperstimulation may happen and it may lead to prolonged deceleration so all these three statements are correct so all of the following are true with respect to the condition shown except over here the word except is missing except so except mein aa jayega option d this is not variable deceleration is that clear to all of you so yes this is prolonged deceleration there is uterine hyperstimulation this uterine hyperstimulation can lead to prolonged deceleration and uterine hyperstimulation can be a result of uh, drugs like mesoprost and oxytocin clear to all of you yes just one more thing sometimes you know ye jo variable decelerations hote hain they occur in such a quick succession that in your ctg strip you may get an image like this right so if you are getting a ctg strip with deceleration like this that also means variable deceleration here variable decelerations are happening in a very quick succession right so this is also variable deceleration okay So look over here. Look at this piece of the graph. What are you seeing over here? You are seeing that fetal heart rate is not fixed. It is changing from five to twenty-five beats per minute. Can you see it? Fetal heart rate is not fixed over here. You cannot read the numbers over here, but you can at least make out from the graph that fetal heart rate is not fixed. It is continuously changing. right this is what is variability beat to beat variability right this is beat to beat variability and over here you can see beat to beat variability very very clearly now compare this with this over here what are you seeing over here i am seeing over here that roughly the fetal heart rate is fixed to 150 beats per minute roughly right so over here what i am getting is absent variability or decreased beat to beat variability whenever you get decreased beat to beat variability along with variable deceleration then that is a category 3 ctg finding that is a category 3 ctg tracing and in this case you have to go for immediate termination of pregnancy and before you terminate her pregnancy while you are preparing you have to do intrauterine resuscitation right clear to all of you okay now this image over here this image which you are seeing over here this is a pyogenic granuloma or an epulis or a pregnancy tumor please remember if they show you this image and they ask you what is this this is a pyogenic granuloma or an epulis or a pregnancy tumor it should never be excised a pregnancy tumor or an epulis should never be excised that is what you have to remember about it this is automatically going to regress once the pregnancy is over right next question next question they may show you an image like this right so this image what are you seeing over here in this image you are measuring the nuchal translucency right and there may be various questions which can be asked on nuchal translucency 
in nuchal translucency they can ask you a question true statements with respect to measurement of nuchal translucency are number 1 it should be measured in mid sagittal plane yes it should be measured in mid sagittal plane it should be measured when crown rump length is between 45 to 84 someone has written should tocolytics be used in resuscitation uh, in intrauterine resuscitation that depends upon if there is uterine hyperstimulation and aapne oxytocin band kar diya hai tab bhi uterus hyperstimulate kar raha hai then you are going to use tocolytics also for intrauterine resuscitation normally we don't use a tocolytic but if there is uterine hyperstimulation then you are going to use clear measured when crown rump length is between 45 to 84 mm yes it should be measured from inner border to inner border so all these are prerequisites for measuring nuchal translucency and these should be on your tips right prerequisites for measuring nuchal translucency head should be partially extended no head should be in neutral position it is done between 12 to 15 plus 6 days no for nuchal translucency ultrasound is done between 11 to 13 weeks plus 6 days right the other thing which you have to remember is while measuring nuchal translucency measurement has to be taken from the widest area and amnion should be seen separately so these are all prerequisites for measuring nuchal translucency if nuchal translucency is more than equal to 3 mm the most common reason will be a trisomy and the most common trisomy will be 21 followed by 18 followed by 13 second most common is turner syndrome and third most is cardiac defect now a similar image which you may confuse is that of cystic hygroma now in cystic hygroma also the image is very similar to nuchal translucency image but the difference is in cystic hygroma this fluid filled area will be larger than nuchal translucency number 1 number 2 it is going to extend more than what nuchal translucency was extending and a septa may be present so if you are getting an image like nuchal translucency but the fluid filled area is more and this is extending more then also it means it is cystic hygroma and if septa are present so if you look closely in this image the septa is not seen but in certain images you will you might see fine thin septa inside the fluid then that means it's a cystic hygroma now cystic hygroma is also a marker of aneuploidy and it is a better marker of aneuploidy than nuchal translucency if you are getting cystic uh, hygroma in first trimester then most common uh, aneuploidy is down syndrome followed by turner syndrome followed by trisomy 18 but if you are getting a cystic hygroma in second trimester ultrasound for the first time you are getting a cystic hygroma in second trimester ultrasound then in 75% cases it is turner syndrome first trimester hai to maximum cases are because of down syndrome then turner syndrome then trisomy 18 right now as i told you that cystic hygroma is a better marker of aneuploidy than turner syndrome but suppose karyotype comes out to be normal in a patient of cystic hygroma then that indicates congenital heart disease like hypoplastic left heart or coarctation of iota or noonan syndrome or high drops fetalis right clear to all of you another very important thing increased nuchal translucency in first trimester increased nuchal translucency in first trimester in case of twins is also one of the earliest marker of twin to twin transfusion syndrome so if it is a twin pregnancy and you are getting increased nuchal translucency then that's an early marker of twin to twin transfusion syndrome right now 
whether it is nuchal translucency or whether it is uh, this cystic hygroma all these are only the screening test ultrasound is only the screening test for aneuploidy diagnostic test for aneuploidy is always karyotyping and how do you obtain the tissue for karyotyping tissue for karyotyping can be obtained by two procedures in the first trimester it can be obtained by chorionic villi sampling so in this image what you are seeing that the needle is going up till the placenta that is the chorionic villi so this image over here is image of chorionic villi sampling please remember best time to do chorionic villi sampling is 11 to 13 weeks it should never be done before 10 weeks because if you do it before 10 weeks it will lead to oro mandibular or limb defects in the fetus oro mandibular or limb defects in the fetus if someone asks you what is the most common complication of chorionic villi sampling most common complication of chorionic villi sampling is fetal loss the other problem with chorionic villi sampling is you can get placental two cell lines that is placental mosaicism can be present so that is a problem disadvantage of chorionic villi sampling that you may get two cell lines right but what is called as placental mosaicism now this image over here what is this image in this image you are seeing that the needle is going up till the amniotic fluid so this is amniocentesis amniocentesis can be done any time between 15 to 20 weeks best time is 16 to 18 weeks amniocentesis is a safer procedure than chorionic villi sampling because fetal loss with amniocentesis is much less than um, chorionic villi sampling right and amniocentesis it can be done not only in second trimester but in third trimester also in third trimester when do you do amniocentesis in third trimester you do amniocentesis when you want to know the lung maturity of the fetus or if there are any fetal infections and you want to do pcr of the amniotic fluid then you go for amniocentesis in third trimester then it is also therapeutic in case of polyhydramnios so a uh, am serial amniocentesis may be done in case of polyhydramnios if mother is having respiratory difficulties clear but yes amniocentesis is a safer procedure than chorionic villi sampling now what image are you seeing over here first tell me what image is this and then tell me what is the anomaly which you are seeing over here what chromosomal anomaly are you seeing over here this image is a karyotyping image right and in this karyotype what am i seeing i am seeing that this is an xy individual right this is an xy individual that means this is a male child and i am seeing that in all chromosomes there is a pair but in 21 chromosome there is one extra chromosome so this male child has trisomy 21 clear to all of you so the diagnostic test for aneuploidy is karyotyping you may go for cell free dna testing fetal cell free dna testing that is a non invasive prenatal test but then it is a secondary screening test it is not a diagnostic test it is the it is the test which has highest sensitivity so it has maximum sensitivity right and it can be done any time beyond 10 weeks 
right? So this is NIPT or fetal cell free DNA testing. But remember, it's a secondary screening test. It's not a diagnostic test. And yes, it is expensive. Right? Then coming to images of placental anomaly. Now, in this image, what you are seeing? In this image, you are seeing that there are two lobes of the placenta. right, which are approximately of the same size, right, and they are connected by blood vessels. So, this is placenta by lobata, right. Similar kind of image, but here one part of the placenta, one lobe of the placenta is small, the other one is big and it is connected by blood vessels. So, this is placenta succinturiata right go to the next image if you get an image where there is a small lobe which is separated from the main lobe and there are no connecting blood vessels there are no connecting blood vessels then that is placenta spuria now over here what you are getting over here you are getting that the matern uh, the fetal side of the placenta is small and it is surrounded by the maternal side of the placenta. It is surrounded by the maternal side of the placenta. And in between them, can you see over here this arrow pointing towards a valve-like thickening? So this over here is your circumvallate placenta. Yes, someone said Pani Puri shape. Yes, this is Pani Puri shape, right? So, fetal side is small, maternal side is big and you are getting a thickening in between. This is a circumvallate placenta. Complications which can be seen with circumvallate and circummarginate placenta are abruptio placenta, preterm labor and fetal growth restriction. All these complications are more with circumvallate than with circummarginate. Right now, in this over here, this is the fetal side of the placenta, right? And this over here is maternal side of the placenta, and you are not seeing any, there is no thickening, and that means this is circummarginate placenta, right? Clear to all of you? So, this is a circummarginate placenta. Now, look over here. This is normally how the cord is inserted. Normally, the cord is inserted in the center of the fetal side of the placenta. This is normal cord insertion. Compare it with this image. Over here, you are seeing that the cord is inserted to the margins of the placenta. Now, whenever the cord is inserted to the margins of the placenta, that is what is such a placenta is called as battle door placenta and such an insertion is called as marginal insertion of the cord, right? So, this over here is a battle door placenta. Now, look over here. What you are seeing over here? In this image, you are seeing that the cord has bifurcated into blood vessels and it is these blood vessels which are now going and getting attached to the placenta. This is what is called as velamentous insertion of the cord. So, in velamentous insertion of the cord, this is another image. So, if this over here is the placenta, this is the cord. Cord is going to stop few centimeters before the placenta. The blood vessels are going to lose the Wharton's jelly and the blood vessels will individually go and get attached to the placenta. This is velamentous insertion of the cord which may lead to Vasa Previa, right? Now, these are three ultrasound signs of early pregnancy. I have done with them, uh, done these signs with you in the PYQ session also. So, in this image, what you are seeing? In this image, you are seeing 
that a gestational sac has been formed and in other words blastocyst has inserted inside the endometrium this is what is called as intradecidual sign right then this over here is double decidual sac sign in double decidual sac sign you can see that the blastocyst is surrounded by two rings the inner ring is decidua capsularis the outer ring is decidua parietalis so double decidual sac sign is due to decidua capsularis and decidua parietalis right and the third is double bleb sign in double bleb sign you are seeing two bleb like uh, bubbles two bubbles inside the sac and this is due to formation of yolk sac and amniotic sac so this is double bleb sign double decidual sac sign and double bleb sign indicate intrauterine pregnancy whereas intradecidual sign only indicates pregnancy it does not indicate intrauterine pregnancy intrauterine pregnancy is indicated by double decidual sac sign and double bleb sign so these are all questions which were asked in your previous years right now this image over here this is a specimen of anencephaly right and i'm sure in your undergraduate times all of you have seen this specimen in anencephaly the cranial vault is absent the most common presentation which you get in anencephaly is face presentation it is more common in girls right this is more common in female fetuses i should say it's more common in female fetuses right now anencephaly leads to polyhydramnios it can lead to preterm labor and it can also lead to post term pregnancy post term pregnancy is more common than preterm labor this is because the adrenal glands of the fetus are also absent in case of anencephaly the, on ultrasound you may get a shower cap sign right shower cap sign now i am showing you the ultrasound images of anencephaly now in anencephaly you may get image like this so what you are seeing over here is a mickey mouse face sign so a triangular face that is mickey mouse sign with bulging eyes so can you see a triangular face with bulging eyes right this is what is your uh, on ultrasound anencephaly appears like this so there are this is frog eye sign and this is what is called as mickey mouse sign and over here this is the shower cap sign because of absent vault you get shower cap sign right now if image is given like this it is very easy to recognize but sometimes this is your i and i set question where you get an image like this over here you can see the bulging eyes so this is bulging eyes absent skull and this is also an ultrasound image of anencephaly now anencephaly can first be recognized earliest it can be recognized by 10 weeks that means on first trimester ultrasound but for the best diagnosis ultrasound should be done at 14 weeks that is in second trimester anencephaly is the earliest congenital anomaly which can be recognized on ultrasound right so it can earliest be recognized by 10 weeks best it can be recognized by 14 weeks right now these days whether you are doing a screening test or whether it is diagnostic test both the screening and the diagnostic test for anencephaly are ultrasounds in anencephaly alpha fetoprotein levels are raised but the most specific biochemical marker most specific biochemical marker for anencephaly is acetylcholine esterase acetylcholine esterase right clear to all of you now 
do not confuse anencephaly image with encephalocele what is encephalocele see both anencephaly and encephalocele are neural tube defects and that to cranial defects right now in case of anencephaly so when the neural tube is formed the cranial neuropore fails to close the cranial neuropore fails to close and because of this there is no skin there are no major meninges entire skull is absent in case of encephalocele there is a small defect in the neural tube and through this small defect the brain tissue herniates out enclosed in skin so as you can see the brain tissue has herniated out and it is enclosed in with skin this is encephalosky seal so in encephalosky seal skull will be present meninges will be present in anencephaly no skull no meninges right so this is how the ultrasound image of encephalocele is going to appear you are going to see that the skull is present and you are going to see the meninges are present and there is a small protrusion which is happening and this is what is encephalocele right now mostly the defect is seen in the squamous part of the occipital bone clear then caudal defects in the fetus uh, they could be the meningocele or they can be milo meningo milocele what is the difference in meningocele and meningo milocele in meningocele it is only the meninges which herniate out the spinal cord doesn't herniate out in meningo milocele you will also see the spinal cord coming out along with the meninges so over here what you are seeing is in this case what i am seeing is that this is a caudal defect and i can see that yes the meninges have herniated out and i can also see something inside it's not clear agar keval csf hota so this black area would have been very clear black this is not clear black there is something inside it because it is not very clear black so this means i am looking at an ultrasound image of meningo milocele right so all these are varieties of spina bifida and i'm sure you know spina bifida more than me through your surgery faculty so they can be spina bifida occulta they can be spina bifida aperta right and then it can be further divided into meningocele and meningo milocele so this over here is an image of meningo milocele number 1 number 2 when you do skull ultrasound in case of spina bifida there are certain characteristic features which you may get and this over here are the characteristic images which you get when you do ultrasound of skull in case of spina bifida number 1 what you are seeing over here is bossing of the frontal bone this bossing of frontal bone is lemon sign and you can see downward protrusion of cerebellum or downward displacement of cerebellum which is called as the banana sign so lemon sign and banana sign are seen in case of spina bifida right so if you are getting these ultrasounds this is spina bifida they are also seen in chiari type 2 malformation or arnold chiari malformations right then coming to these two images of uh, malformations now you tell me what are you seeing over here these are now this is not a skull defect this over here is abdominal wall defect in one of these images what i am seeing is that the abdominal content has herniated out and it is enclosed in a covering right and in the second image i have seen that i have, i am seeing abdominal wall, uh, content has herniated out the intestines have herniated out but they are not enclosed in a covering so if they are enclosed in a covering it is omphalocele if it is not enclosed in a covering it is gastroschisis right so how on ultrasound uh, are you going to differentiate between them this over here is an abdominal wall defect where you are seeing that 
this defect is irregular right the abdominal wall content which has herniated out is irregular it is cauliflower like growth so that means there is no sac and that means it is an ultrasound of gastroschisis right in this case over here what am i seeing i am seeing this over here is the fetus this is the abdomen and from the abdomen i am seeing that the contents are protruding out but they are regular that means they are covered by a sac and that they are inside a sac and that means this is omphalocele please remember herniation of bowel loop in the cord is physiological till 8 to 11 weeks so till 8 to 11 weeks this is absolutely physiological so whenever you have to make a diagnosis of omphalocele it should always be made after 11 weeks right till 8 to 11 weeks this is physiological right okay now next very important image is this image now in this image what you are seeing in this image so first you know this image has moved a little don't uh, look at the orange markings which are there now in this image what you are seeing you are seeing the stomach bubble and you are seeing a hockey stick like appearance right so this is hockey stick sign and this over here is stomach bubble that is fetal stomach right so this is how in this plane we measure the abdominal circumference whenever you have to measure abdominal circumference three structures should be visible and then in that plane you measure abdominal circumference what are those three structures which should be uh, visible p u s so p stands for portal sinus u for umbilical vein and s for fetal stomach so fetal stomach umbilical vein and portal sinus should be visible then in this plane i am going to measure the abdominal circumference now umbilical vein and portal sinus make a hockey stick sign so whenever this hockey stick sign and fetal stomach are visible then you are going to measure abdominal circumference and abdominal circumference is the best ultrasound parameter to detect macrosomia or to detect iugr if abdominal circumference is more than equal to 35 cm that indicates macrosomia right so if abdominal circumference is more than equal to 35 cm that indicates macrosomia clear to all of you now these are some of the instruments which are important although all instruments i have covered in a separate video which is there on the marrow youtube channel but a few important ones i'm quickly taking up with you what is uh, instrument a showing you instrument a is a carmen scanula right carmen scanula which is used for doing suction and evacuation option b is uh, this image b is hagar's dilators this is a hagar's dilator please remember this question is very oftenly asked that the number which is written on carmen cannula it it should correspond to the size of the uterus so the number which you are picking up for a carmen cannula to do mtp it should correspond to the size of the uterus so if you are doing mtp for a 10 weeks pregnant uterus you are going to pick up a 10 number carmen cannula in rural areas the alternative for suction evacuation is manual vacuum aspiration this over here is mva syringe in mva syringe you get two pinch valves number 1 number 2 manual vacuum aspiration it can be done between 7 to 12 weeks whereas with the help of carmen cannula and electric evacuation you can do suction evacuation till 16 weeks so maximum i can use a 16 mm cannula for doing suction evacuation but for manual vacuum aspiration manual vacuum aspiration can be done only up till 7 to 12 weeks now the pressure which is generated by this mva syringe is 660 mm of mercury that's the best answer if that is not given then 600 mm of mercury 
clear to all of you now this should be compared with menstrual regulation syringe menstrual regulation syringe these days this is outdated it is no longer used menstrual regulation syringe has a single valve these days the menstrual regulation syringe which is being used is a simple syringe it's a simple 50 ml syringe and with menstrual regulation you can do mtp up till 6 weeks right so up till 6 weeks you can use menstrual regulation syringe but that's no longer used because up till 7 weeks the best method these days is medical abortion so uh, we never use menstrual regulation syringe now and between 7 to 12 weeks the best method is suction and evacuation clear to all of you yes okay this over here is a spoon shaped forceps and this is the forcep which doesn't have any lock there is no ratchet lock and it has a spoon shaped proximal end right so this is an ovum forceps this is an ovum forceps clear to all of you right now what procedure can you see over here what procedure is being done in this image i am seeing that this over here is the uterus right this is the pouch of douglas this over here is bladder so i am seeing that a needle is going up till the pouch of douglas that means this is caldocentesis right in caldocentesis if you get blood which doesn't clot then that means there is hemoperitoneum right so there is blood inside the pouch of douglas if you get blood which clots on keeping then that means your needle has entered a vessel so your needle has entered a vessel hemoperitoneum means a ruptured ectopic clear okay now what are you seeing over here over here you are seeing that this over here is a mass which is there in the adnexa it is not clear it has got solid components so it is a complex adnexal mass and i can see that when i have switched the doppler on i am getting blood flow around this mass so this is what is ring of fire sign ring of fire sign so this is a complex adnexal mass with a ring of fire appearance now this is seen in ectopic pregnancy but please remember it is not diagnostic of ectopic pregnancy right so this ring of fire appearance is seen uh in ectopic pregnancy but it is not diagnostic clear what you are seeing over here here it is appearing as if there are a lot of snowflakes right so this is a snow storm appearance on ultrasound and snow storm appearance on ultrasound is seen in case of complete mole the other name for complete mole is hydatiform mole or a vesicular mole right and i have told you in my pyq discussion and also in revision video discussion which i took on youtube everything what you need to know on molar pregnancy so i am not discussing it again here these two images these are chest x rays this over here is a cannon ball appearance of a uh, scene in lungs on chest x ray and this second image b image is a snow storm appearance on chest x ray please remember that whenever there is metastasis to lungs whenever there is a gestational trophoblastic neoplasia which has metastasized to lungs then the most common appearance which you get on chest x ray is a cannon ball appearance and the second most common appearance is snow storm 
appearance lung metastasis means that we are dealing with stage 3 of gtn right this over here is grape like vesicles of molar pregnancy so in molar pregnancy patient may complain of grape like vesicles coming out so this is the image of grape like vesicles and this over here is an image of the decidual cast of ectopic pregnancy in ectopic pregnancy patient may complain of a decidual cast coming out and this is a decidual cast of ectopic pregnancy now coming to these two images these two images are seen in case of abruptio image a is image of a retro placental clot so whenever there is a retro placental clot you have to think about abruptio image b is covular uterus covular uterus is a bruised uterus which you see in case of concealed variety of abruptio right also remember that instead of abruptio placenta in your exams they may use terms like accidental hemorrhage accidental hemorrhage also means it is abruptio or they may use terms like uterine apoplexy uterine apoplexy also means it is a case of abruptio clear to all of you right now coming to the types of placenta previa questions are asked on the types of placenta previa in the form of images so if the placental edge is within 2 cm you know if the placental edge is within 2 cm of the os but it is not covering it that is type 1 placenta previa if the placental edge you know touches the margins of the internal os that is type 2 which is marginal placenta previa if it partially covers the internal os that is type 3 or incomplete and if it completely covers the internal os that is type 4 or complete and i also told you the new classification according to new classification type 1 jo older hai that comes under low lying placenta type 2 type 3 and type 4 are included in the new new classification as placenta previa right okay coming to these three images now this over here is a normal placenta in a normal placenta you can see that the chorionic villi are attached to the decidua but in image a i can see that the chorionic villi are superficially attached to the myometrium so this is an image of placenta accreta in the second image i am seeing that the chorionic villi are inside the myometrium so this is placenta increta and over here i am seeing that the chorionic villi have reached up till the serosa so this is placenta percreta now the two most important risk factors this is what is called as placenta accreta spectra pass right the two most important risk factors for placenta accreta spectrum are previous history of cesarean section and in present pregnancy if there is placenta previa so whenever there is placenta previa in a female always you should do an ultrasound to rule out placenta accreta spectrum right yes in case of placenta accreta spectrum the in pathology also two things are important in pathology the important thing is that the neuta books layer is absent and decidua basalis is absent clear to all of you yes okay now when you are going to do ultrasound in placenta accreta you are going to see placental lakes can you see in the placenta there are these lakes so you are going to see placental lakes with increased blood flow so if inside the placenta you are getting a uh, blood that is you are getting placental lakes with increased blood flow that indicates it is placenta accreta spectrum clear to all of you yes now coming to umbilical artery doppler this over here just give me a moment
So this over here is normal umbilical artery Doppler. This yellow orange color which now I am making pink is the blood flow during systole and this over here is the blood flow during diastole. Right? Now normally what happens as pregnancy advances, what is going to happen? As pregnancy is going to advance, because of progesterone, the peripheral vascular resistance is going to decrease. And because the peripheral vascular resistance is going to decrease, the blood flow during diastole will increase. Right? Jab resistance come hogi, blood flow during diastole is going to increase. In other words, in a normal umbilical artery Doppler, SD ratio decreases in pregnancy. So normally in pregnancy, the SD ratio decreases. So imagine, systole ka time itta blood flow tha. Jaise jaise pregnancy advance kar rahi hai, blood flow in diastole is also increasing. Why it is increasing? Because the resistance in the blood vessels is decreasing. So if I ask you what is happening to SD ratio, because diastole ka blood flow increase kar raha hai, SD ratio decreases in normal pregnancy. Remember, if SD ratio becomes more than equal to 3, that indicates PIH. So in PIH, SD ratio is going to be increased, right? Now, in this Doppler, what are you seeing? In this Doppler, I am seeing that blood is flowing during systole, but it is absent during diastole. Right? So, this is absent end diastolic flow. Whenever there is absent end, we are talking about umbilical artery, beta. This is umbilical artery Doppler. Right? This is umbilical artery Doppler which I am showing you. Clear? Now, Whenever there is absent end diastolic top, uh, absent end diastolic flow, it means that there is preeclampsia. There is the patient's BP is high, and it has also led to IUGR. And in this case, the delivery should be done between 33 to 34 weeks. Right? Pehle 34 kehte the. The latest uh, uh, William says 33 to 34 weeks. Right? Now. What is this image? Very, very important. This image over here is showing you reversed end diastolic flow. Do you see that the blood flow during diastole has reversed? So this is reversed diastolic flow. Whenever there is a reversed diastolic flow, delivery is done between 30 to 32 weeks. Clear to all of you? Very, very important images for your need. So, absent end diastolic flow may delivery between 33 to 34 weeks. Reversed end diastolic flow may delivery between 30 to 32 weeks. Now, what they asked? They had shown this image and they had asked you that patient is 28 weeks pregnant and this is the umbilical artery Doppler which you are getting. Now, how are you going to manage? Ab delivery to hum karte between 30 to 32 weeks. If she is 28 weeks, how am I going to manage her? I am going to hospitalize her. I am going to give her corticosteroids. I am daily going to do her NST. Either her NST has to be done immediately, I mean once or twice daily, right? And her uterine artery Doppler will be repeated two to three times in a week. Immediate termination of pregnancy nahi karte hain in reverse diastolic flow. In reverse diastolic flow, you have to do termination between 30 to 32 weeks. Yes, beta Raj Kumar, that is what I am telling you. 2018 tab tha, ab 2023 hai. 2022 may be answer change ho gaya tha. 2022 may I made you write 32 weeks. Uh, 2021 may I made you write 32 weeks. 2022 ka jab marrow edition is 6 aya, tab tak ka Williams ka naya edition a gaya tha and Williams ke naya edition mein 30 to 32 weeks diya hai. So you have to know the latest things. Right? Clear to all of you? Yes? Now, suppose you get a question that there is IUGR. There is IUGR 
Uh, but the umbilical artery Doppler is normal. Now, when are you going to terminate her pregnancy? Now, if IUGR present hai and umbilical artery Doppler normal hai, in that case, you have to do her Doppler weekly, you have to do NST and biophysical profile weekly, and you have to monitor her for fetal growth after every three weeks. And if the fetal weight is between 3 to 9 percentile, delivery is between 38 to 39 weeks. If fetal weight is less than 3, then 37 weeks. So simply yaad rakho, a very simple thing which you have to remember. Jitni bhi high risk pregnancies hoti hain. Jitni bhi high risk pregnancies hoti hain, chai wo diabetes ho, chai wo PIH ho. In all high risk pregnancies, Doppler should be done weekly. NST and biophysical profile should be done weekly. And ultrasound should be done after three weeks right so kyunki iugr hai and umbilical artery doppler findings normal hai so still it comes under high risk pregnancy so i am going to repeat her doppler weekly i am going to do nst biophysical profile weekly and i am going to do her ultrasound for fetal growth in every 3 weeks lekin kahi patient ke aise ho gaya ki reverse diastolic flow milne laga ya absent diastolic flow milne laga in that case, now this is a big problem. So now we will not do weekly karenge NST biophysical profile. Now we will do daily karenge NST and biophysical profile. And now we will not do weekly karenge Doppler. Now we will do two to three times in a week karenge Doppler. Right? Clear to all of you? Yes? Absent end diastolic flow may termination of pregnancy 33 to 34 weeks. Reversed end diastolic flow may termination of pregnancy 30 to 32 weeks. Very, very important. This is uterine artery Doppler and uterine artery Doppler may what you are looking over here. This is a diastolic notch. A diastolic notch, if it is persisting beyond 22 to 24 weeks, then that means this patient is going to have PIH. Normally, uterine artery Doppler is done around this time, but these days we are also doing uterine artery Doppler between 11 to 13 weeks. And if you do a uterine artery Doppler, this was your previous year question. If you do uterine artery Doppler between 11 to 13 weeks, you are doing it for early preeclampsia to diagnose cases of early preeclampsia. Clear? Yes? Okay. Now, now what are you seeing over here? Now, in this case, I'm seeing two fetuses. One and two. That means this is an ultrasound of twin pregnancy. Stress, non-stress test, I have I have told you. Okay. Now, in this case, in these two twins, do you see that the placental tissue, this over here is placental tissue, which is coming in between the twins in the form of a peak. This is what is twin peak sign or lambda sign. Twin peak sign or lambda sign is seen in dichorionic diamniotic twins and the best time to do ultrasound is 10 to 14 weeks to see this twin peak sign. In this case, this is twin 1, this is twin 2, this over here is the placenta. Placenta is not coming in between them, right? And that means twin peak sign is absent. But if you closely see over here, there is a very thin line which is coming over here, right? This thin line which is coming over here, can you see a very thin line, right? A very thin membrane coming in between the twins and this is what is your twin P, uh, sorry, this is what is your T sign, right? T sign is seen in monochorionic diamniotic twins. So, twin peak sign is seen in dichorionic diamniotic twins and T sign is seen in monochorionic diamniotic twins. Clear to all of you? Now, they may show you placental images like these and they can ask you, 
which twins do they indicate now why am i saying that this is placenta of twins because i can see two umbilical cords because i am seeing two umbilical cords that is why it is a placenta of twins now in this over here there are thick membranes which are separating the two cords now if there are thick membranes separating the two fetuses or the two cords that means it is a dichorionic diamniotic placental uh, pla placenta it is the placenta of dichorionic diamniotic twins right over here this is one cord this is another cord and there is a very thin membrane separating the two cords so this is the placenta of monochorionic diamniotic twins ab yahan pe ye one placenta another placenta and there is no membrane in between when there is no membrane in between that means monochorionic monoamniotic twins now you will say ki ma'am suppose ye to teeno saath mein thi so we came to know that this is thick and this is thin now if only this is shown how am i going to know whether this is thick membrane or thin membrane right so if it is less than 2 mm thick it is thin if it is more than 2 mm then it is thick more than 2 mm milti hai dichorionic diamniotic mein and less than 2 mm milti hai monochorionic diamniotic mein clear to all of you right now dichorionic diamniotic twins should be delivered by 38 weeks monochorionic diamniotic should be delivered between 34 to 37 weeks right if twin to twin transfusion syndrome is present kyunki twin to twin transfusion syndrome complication hota hai monochorionic diamniotic twins ka so if twin to twin transfusion syndrome is present tab 34 weeks pe deliver karte hain if twin to twin transfusion syndrome is absent then 37 weeks pe in case of monochorionic monoamniotic twins the delivery is done between 32 to 34 weeks by cesarean section conjoint twins are varieties of monochorionic monoamniotic twins right and that is why in conjoint twins also you have to do cesarean section between 32 to 34 weeks right so monochorionic diamniotic twins ka complication hota hai twin to twin transfusion syndrome monochorionic monoamniotic twins ka complication hota hai conjoint twins and cord entanglement cord entanglement clear now over here what you are seeing this over here is a twin ek twin ka amniotic fluid acha hai that is there is polyhydramnios in the sac of one twin i am getting polyhydramnios in the sac of other twin there is rather no amniotic fluid right and hydramnios and it is appearing as if this twin is on one side right it is a stuck twin right so this is twin to twin transfusion syndrome right twin to twin transfusion syndrome ki diagnosis ke liye there are two criterias if both these criterias are fulfilled then it is a case of twin to twin transfusion syndrome number one it should be monochorionic diamniotic twin right number two in one twin you should have poly and in other twin there should be oligo so this is the diagnostic criteria for uh, twin to twin transfusion syndrome clear to all of you yes now look at the image of these two twins what are you getting what are you getting over here in this twin you are seeing that this twin is pale this twin right this twin was pale and what is this twin in this twin you are getting a lot of redness there right so that there is polycythemia one twin has anemia the other twin has polycythemia 
Now, remember, this can be seen in twin to twin transfusion syndrome. In twin to twin transfusion syndrome, one of the twins has anemia, the other twin has polycythemia. But it is not a diagnostic criteria. This is not a diagnostic criteria. As I told you, the diagnostic criteria for twin to twin transfusion syndrome is that one of the twins should have uh, poly, the other should have oligo. Then it can be seen in a condition which is twin anemia polycythemia sequence. Twin anemia polycythemia sequence, right? Now, the other thing which I want all of you to note is in twin to twin transfusion syndrome, what is the staging called as? The staging is called as quintero staging. What is the staging called as? It's quintero staging in twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Clear? Okay. Now coming to another two important images in twins. In this case, in image A, what are you seeing? In image A, you are seeing that this over here, in this baby, the lower limbs are developed, but the upper part of the body is not developed. This is what is called as a cardius a cephalus right a cardius a cephalus right in this second image what you are seeing in the second image you are seeing that this over here is just some fetal tissue you cannot identify any part in this fetal tissue this is a cardius amorphous both these conditions they come under trap what is trap? Twin reversed arterial perfusion. Twin reversed arterial perfusion. So, if I ask you, what are the complications which are seen in monochorionic twins? What are the complications which you get in monochorionic twins? Number one, you can get twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Number two, you can get TAPS. Number three, you can get TRAP. Number four, you can get selective IUGR. What do you understand by selective IUGR? Selective IUGR means that one twin will have IUGR, the other twin will not have IUGR, right? Dono twins may IUGR hai, so that can be a complication of dichorionic twins. But if only one twin has IUGR, that's a complication of twin, uh, that's a complication of monochorionic twins. Clear? Okay. Now, come to this image over here. Identify the lie of the fetus in the following image. Tell, identify the lie of the fetus in the following image. Option A, longitudinal lie. Option B, oblique lie. Option C, transverse lie. Option D, unstable lie. So I have started getting answers from all of you and you are saying maximum are saying oblique lie. Some of you are saying longitudinal lie. I just hope that these some are the ones jinko maine gsog classes mein padhaya hai bhatia mein padhaya hai and jinko maine maro mein padhaya hai because specifically i have told you that whenever you are commenting on the lie of the fetus you have to first make the uterus straight is image mein uterus hi turned hai right so when the uterus is turned, I cannot comment upon the lie. I have to first make the uterus straight and then I have to comment upon the lie. So, when I am going to make the uterus straight, ye jo abhi oblique dikh raha hai, ye longitudinal ban jayega. Right? So, you have to first correct the dextro rotation of the uterus and then you have to comment upon the lie. Right? So, this is longitudinal lie. This is not 
a case of oblique lie please be very very careful clear to all of you yes okay now this image over here is showing you transverse lie in transverse lie the presentation which you get is shoulder presentation and management of transverse lie always is cesarean section it is transverse lie which is associated with maximum chances of cord prolapse now in case of transverse lie you may also get hand prolapse and again images which you tend to confuse in one of the marrow gts you were given this image and you all thought that this is a hand prolapse but to hand prolapse ka matlab hai ki baby transverse lie mein hoga and then the hand is coming out this is hand prolapse or this is neglected shoulder presentation neglected shoulder presentation baby has to be in transverse lie and management is cesarean section right but look at this image over here in this image i can see the baby's head right this means it is vertex it is head plus it is the hand which has come there can you see over here so the hand of the baby is just above the fetal head this is compound presentation right compound presentation and compound presentation may most of the times it is the hand which is going to lie close to the head of the baby compound presentation may you continue with vaginal delivery most of the times the head of the baby is going to come out automatically and hand will regress back right clear to all of you so in this case you have to continue vaginal delivery in this case you have to go for cesarean section now the most confusing images which you find you people are so confused about position of the fetus so now tell me how uh, what is the position of the fetus in image a and in image b now whenever you have to comment on the feet position of the fetus tell me uh what is that you're going to look at you are going to look at the occiput if it is a vertex then you have to look at the occiput so this over here is the occiput of the baby right now in this case the occiput of the baby first tell me is the occiput towards uh, pubic symphysis or is the occiput towards sacral promontory or is it in between here the occiput is in between the pubic symphysis and sacral promontory so this is occipito transverse now because this is on your left side it will be mother's right side because whenever we are conducting delivery we are conducting delivery from this position over here so our left corresponds to mother's right clear now look at image b in image b this over here is the triangular fontanel in other words the posterior fontanel and just below the posterior fontanel lies the occiput and because this posterior fontanel is exactly in the center it is midway between pubic symphysis and sacral promontory so again this is occipito transverse now because this is your right so it is going to be mother's left clear so this is left occipito transverse position now this over here is partogram in this partogram you are seeing an alert line you are seeing an action line right this means this is modified who partogram modified who partogram now the time duration between alert line and action line is 4 hours each big square on partogram corresponds to 1 hour 
each small square corresponds to 30 minutes right now as long as labor is towards the right of as towards the left of alert line it is normal if the progress of labor comes to the right of alert line that means some now the patient should get uh, now the obstetrician should get alerted and if a referral has to be made to a higher center it has to be made at this point if the progress of labor comes to the right of action line now you need to take some action so as long as the progress of the labor is to the left of alert line it is normal if it is to the right of alert line then the obstetrician should get alerted right and if it is to the right of action line action should be taken next question which they ask you is when are you going to do the first plotting where do you do the first plotting now the first plotting has to be done on the alert line right so agar 4 cm pe patient aa rahi hai hamare paas right so i am going to do the first plotting here ab suppose by chance patient mere paas aayi when she is 8 cm dilated ab agar patient 8 cm dilated aayi and agar maine plotting yahan se shuru kari do you ever think that this is going to cross the alert line no right so whenever a patient comes to me agar patient mere paas 8 cm pe aayegi i am going to make my first plotting on the alert line and then subsequent plottings mein i am going to see ki whether it the progress is to the left whether the progress is to the right of alert line is that clear to all of you now once you got a question where it was written that the first plotting on a partogram should be made option a left of alert line option b right of alert line option c left of action line option d right of action line Ab aise options agar diye hain, then you are going to say that the first plotting has to be made to the left of alert line but the best answer is that the first plotting has to be made on the alert line clear to all of you number one number two next thing in modified who partogram active phase begins at four centimeters so the plotting begins at four centimeters now we have a next generation partogram. Now this next generation partogram is which labor care guide. Kehte hai. Labor care guide. Labor care guide and normal partogram mein, there are some differences. Number one difference is that over here there is no alert line and there is no action line right number two difference is the second stage of labor is represented jabki in modified who partogram second stage of labor was not represented number three here the active phase begins at five centimeters right so plotting is going to begin at five centimeters right so by looking at this partogram i can you can tell me since there is no alert line there is no action line this is labor care guide or the next generation partogram pe if you see it is the first stage of labor and also the second stage of labor which is represented right third thing is partogram me jo modified who partogram tha in modified who partogram hum apne aap se is partogram ko three parts mein divide karte the the first part used to tell me about fetal heart rate about everything related to fetus second part of the partogram was a cervicograph jo ki labor ki progress batata tha and jo third part tha partogram ka so this was the second part 
जो थर्ड पार्ट था पार्टोग्राम का वो मदर की कंडीशन बताता था कि कितने कॉन्ट्रैक्शन हो गए हैं या कि कौन सी ड्रग्स देनी है ऑक्सीटोसिन कितना दिया है बीपी कितना है मदर का टेम्परेचर कितना है पल्स रेट कितना है राइट सो आर्बिटेरली हम इसको तीन पार्ट में डिवाइड करते थे नंबर वन पार्ट वॉज टेलिंग मी अबाउट फीटल कंडीशन देन बीच में इट वॉज टेलिंग मी अबाउट प्रोग्रेस ऑफ लेबर एंड नीचे द बॉटम पार्ट यूज टू टेल मी अबाउट मेटर्नल कंडीशन नाउ इफ यू लुक एट लेबर केयर गाइड इट इज ऑलरेडी डिवाइडेड इन टू सेवन सेक्शन राइट सेवन सेक्शन सो लेबर केयर गाइड में देर आर सेवन सेक्शन नाउ यू नीड टू नो वॉट आर द सेवन सेक्शन फर्स्ट सेक्शन इज एवरी थिंग रिलेटेड टू पेशेंट सो पेशेंट की डिटेल्स आती है इन फर्स्ट पार्ट ऑफ द सेक्शन जो सेवेंथ सेक्शन है दैट हैज द प्लान वॉट प्लान आर यू मेकिंग फॉर द पेशेंट राइट अब बीच के जो सेक्शन हैं, यू कैन रिमेंबर टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स इट इज स्मार्ट ब्यूटिफुल वुमन लव मी राइट सो ऑल बॉयज यू आर गोइंग टू रिमेंबर इट सो वेल स्मार्ट ब्यूटिफुल वुमेन लव मी एस स्टैंड फॉर सपोर्टिव केयर so in section 2 you are going to note down everything related to supportive care and this is a new section ye pehle usme tha hi nahi supportive care supportive care mein we include ki kaun si position ki patient was in which position then whether for pain relief has she taken anything or not whether oral intake how much was her oral intake and whether there was any attendant or not a companion or not right so that all comes under supportive care then b stands for baby's detail baby's detail mein theek hai fetal heart rate last wale partogram mein bhi tha ab bhi hai yahan pe ek special section aaya hai deceleration ka section ki deceleration now we also mentioned ki decelerations kitne ho rahe hain राइट अदर देन दैट एम्योटिक फ्लूड कैपर्ट मोल्डिंग ऑल दैट ये सब पहले भी था देन कम्स वीमेन इन वीमेन वी आर गोइंग टू इंक्लूड कि मदर के क्या वाइटल्स थे वीमेन के वाइटल्स क्या थे सो वॉट वॉज हर पल्स रेट वॉट वॉज हर टेम्परेचर वॉट वॉज हर बीपी राइट हर यूरिन की डिटेल्स वॉट इज नॉट इंक्लूडेड इज रेस्पिरेटरी रेट एंड एसपीओ टू वो पहले भी नहीं था अभी भी नहीं है राइट right? then l l stands for labor progress labor progress in labor progress we are going to include kitta uterine contraction then how much is the dilatation of the cervix how much is the descent of fetal head then m m stands for medications इन मेडिकेशन वी आर गोइंग टू इंक्लूड कि हाउ मच ऑक्सीटोसिन वॉज गिवेन या कोई एनी अदर मेडिसिन वॉज गिवेन वेदर आई वी फ्लूड वर गिवेन और नॉट राइट सो दीज आर द सेवन सेक्शन ऑफ लेबर केयर गाइड सो हैव यू अंडरस्टूड लेबर केयर गाइड लेबर केयर गाइड में इट इज फोकसिंग मोर ऑन इंडिविजुअल केयर ड्यूरिंग लेबर राइट number 1 number 2 there is first stage of labor and the second stage of labor which is represented number 3 there is no alert line there is no action line number 4 it has seven sections number 5 active phase in labor care guide begins from 5 cm so plotting begins from 5 cm now priya is asking ye details yaad karni padengi priya keval itna yaad rakho 1 to 7 sections mein kya kya aata hai the sequence ki 1 to 7 sections see over here section 1 is everything about patient section 2 is supportive care because section 2 naya section aaya hai i want you to remember this ki companion kaun tha pain relief oral fluid and posture section 3 mein it is fetus ke bare mein only thing which you have to remember is decelerations isme ab add hue hain section 4 mein 
इट इज सेम जो पहले से मदर के बारे में हम रिकॉर्ड करते थे वही रिकॉर्ड करते हैं सेक्शन फाइव में भी जो पहले रिकॉर्ड करते थे वही रिकॉर्ड करते हैं सेक्शन सिक्स में भी जो पहले रिकॉर्ड करते थे वही रिकॉर्ड करते हैं राइट सो दिस इज वॉट यू हैव टू क्लियर हैव यू अंडरस्टूड लेबर केयर गाइड ओके नाउ कम टू दिस इमेज ओवर हियर See, I know I am taking a little detailed discussion. This is because it is including all images from Obz and Gynae, right? None of the images are going to be left. Uh, Meet, Meet, please remember कि ACOG कहता है और अभी भी कहता है पहले भी कहता था अभी भी कहता है कि active phase begins from six centimeters. अर्लियर डब्ल्यू एच ओ कहता था कि एक्टिव फेज बिगिन होता है फोर सेंटीमीटर्स पे नाउ डब्ल्यू एच ओ से एक्टिव फेज बिगिन होता है फाइव सेंटीमीटर्स से राइट सो दैट इज वाई जो लेबर केयर गाइड है उसमें फाइव सेंटीमीटर है एंड जो मॉडिफाइड डब्ल्यू एच ओ पार्टोग्राम है उसमें फोर सेंटीमीटर्स है क्लियर Next question. See the image. This is the condition which was seen in a multi gravida when she came to labor room after a dye tried to deliver at home. Patient has been in labor for two days. Her cervix is eight centimeters dilated. Vagina is hot and dry. Fetal head is at minus three station. What is the next step in management? Answer me. क्या करें? आंसर अगर आपको एक्टिव फेज पे कभी भी ऐसा नहीं पूछा जाएगा एक्टिव फेज बिगिन एट क्योंकि एग्जामिनर को भी मालूम है कि एसीओजी की गाइडलाइंस डिफरेंट है डब्ल्यू एच ओ की गाइडलाइंस डिफरेंट है सो दे आर गोइंग टू आस्क यू एज पर द न्यू डब्ल्यू एच ओ रिकमेंडेशन या अकॉर्डिंग टू लेबर केयर गाइड कुछ ना कुछ दिया होगा राइट ओके सो फर्स्ट वॉट इज दिस कंडीशन शोइंग दिस ओवर हियर इज शोइंग यू बैंडल्स रिंग दिस इज बैंडल्स रिंग Bandel's ring is seen in case of obstructed labor, and whenever there is obstructed labor, the only management which you have to do is cesarean section. In Bandel's ring, the upper uterine segment is tonically contracted, and the lower uterine segment is relaxed. So, a depression or a ring can be felt between the upper segment and lower segment. Clear? Now, coming to all the maneuvers. images of all maneuvers is important so these are the maneuvers which are related to breach maneuvers related to breach delivery quickly we will do this because i know all of you know these maneuvers in this maneuver what you are seeing you are seeing that the finger is being taken in the groin area and traction is being given this is groin traction this is done for delivery of buttocks in case of flexed breach so this is done for delivery of buttocks in case of flexed breach right oxytocin yes is never given in obstructed labor agar oxytocin doge to going to lead to uterine rupture clear to all of you then this over here you are seeing that a finger is being taken up till the popliteal fossa p for popliteal fossa p for pinards maneuver right this is done for delivery of legs in case of extended breach that is frank breach in case of frank breach right in this case what i am seeing in this case i am seeing ki breach ki legs deliver ho gayi hai now the back is being rotated and this is what is called as lofsets maneuver if you see the back being rotated this is being done for delivery of the shoulder lofsets maneuver is for delivery of shoulder over here what i am seeing that the baby is hanging by its own weight then i am taking the holding the feet of the baby and taking it towards mother's abdomen this is what is burn marshal technique burn marshal technique is for delivery of the after coming head of breech when the dorsum of the baby is anterior so in dorso anterior breech presentation for dorso anterior breech presentations 
if i want to deliver the head of the fetus then i go for burn marshall technique now similarly in dorso anterior breech presentation i can go do a second technique where you are seeing that fingers are kept on the cheek bone and pressure is also being given on the shoulder of the baby with the other hand this is what is called as melar flexion and shoulder traction or morisseau smiley wheat technique right both these are methods for delivery of after coming head of breech in dorso anterior breech now this image over here in this image you are seeing that the dorsum is posterior it is the face of the baby which is anterior and the head of the baby is being delivered so whenever you are getting in dorso posterior for after coming head of breech the maneuver which you do is prague's maneuver so this is prague's maneuver please compare prague's maneuver with burn marshall technique burn marshall technique may it is the occiput which is facing towards the pubic symphysis dorsum is anterior right here it is the face which is facing towards the pubic symphysis and dorsum is posterior so this is prague's maneuver this over here i am seeing this over here is the head of the baby this is cephalic presentation and during cephalic presentation a maneuver is being done that means during normal vaginal delivery for delivery of the fetal head a maneuver is being done and the only maneuver which you do for delivery of the fetal head in a uh, cephalic presentation in vertex presentation it is retigen maneuver in retigen maneuver with one hand you are going to support the perineum with the other hand initially you are going to flex the head of the baby so that the smallest diameter comes out and then you are going to extend the head this is what is called as retigen maneuver please remember that who recommends perineal massage who recommends warm compressors at the perineum who recommends retigen maneuver who recommends that you should support the perineum these are all recommendations of who to prevent perineal tear to prevent perineal tear but who does not recommend fundal pressure and who does not recommend routine episiotomy right now what are the maneuvers which you use for shoulder dystocia in this maneuver what you are seeing that the leg of the baby uh, of the mother is flexed right so when the leg of the mother is flexed and it will later on be abducted that is what is mac roberts maneuver a mac roberts maneuver it results in straightening of the sacrum so the available space increases please do not say that the pelvic diameters increase pelvic diameters do not increase the available space increases most commonly nerve which is injured when you do mac roberts maneuver is lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh and the patient may come to you as a case of myalgia parasthetica that can be numbness and tingling on the lateral part of the thigh right mac roberts maneuver is the first maneuver and the most effective maneuver to manage shoulder dystocia in this case what i am seeing is that with my fingers so i have taken two fingers and i am trying to rotate the shoulders anterior shoulder also and posterior shoulder also so when you are trying to rotate the anterior and the posterior shoulder this is what is woods corkscrew maneuver right in this image third image the mother is lying on all four limbs and then i am trying to deliver the shoulders this is gaskin maneuver or all four maneuver right this over here is an episiotomy scissors episiotomy scissors they will have both the tips are going to be blunt and it will be bent at an angle please remember episiotomy is given at an angle of 60 degrees the most commonly used episiotomy is medio lateral episiotomy right which is given at an angle of 60 degrees the range is 45 to 60 degrees in a medio lateral 
episiotomy there is increased blood loss it takes more time to repair it takes more time to heal but still we prefer it because it does not extend and it never involves the anal sphincter now they ask you what are the muscles which are cut during episiotomy remember the muscles which are not cut during episiotomy the muscles which are not cut during episiotomy are the ones which are lateral right and that means ischio cavernous ischio coccygeus and obturator muscles they are never cut during episiotomy and definitely you don't cut anal sphincter during episiotomy this over here is image of bakri balloon catheter and this bakri balloon catheter is used for managing pph they ask you what is the maximum capacity of bakri balloon catheter it is 500 ml right This over here is a B-link suture. This is the most commonly used compression suture in case of PPH. The other compression sutures which you can use are Heyman suture, Ganschella suture, and Cho square sutures. Then next question over here, this image. Uh, this is a PYQ question which was asked in NEET 2020. All of the following are contraindications for the use of the instrument shown in the image, except so option A face presentation, option B fetal distress, option C preterm, and option D cephalopelvic disproportion. There are one set of images which I have forgotten to include, and they are Leopold maneuvers. Leopold maneuvers are very very important just now i will include it here right so i'll take an image from the google quickly and we will do leopold maneuvers also so tell me your answers c it is please first understand the question is saying all of the following are contraindications except most of you are answering it incorrectly right please remember contraindications for any instrumental delivery